So have you ever struggled with figuring out the type of variable which is in the end an interface? Well, type assertions and type switches are your go-to tools when it comes to handling different logic based on the type of a variable. And really type switches and type assertions are really powerful tools that you can use to basically determine the type of a variable which is stored in an interface. And that's why we are going to have an in-depth look in this video into the type switches and type assertions and a really powerful combination of the type switches and generics in Golang. Now before we jump into the code and into the actual video, it is important to note that these type switches and type assertions obviously come with a cost. So they do give you a lot of flexibility, but in the end these type switches do come with a runtime overhead due to the type discovery process. So let's quickly look at a really simple example to demonstrate type assertions in Golang. Okay, so to demonstrate type assertions we're going to look at an interface type, right? Not the plain interface we are known to have in Golang, but I mean the type in this case. So for instance, let's just say that we declare a variable, let's just call it A for instance, and then we declare the type as interface. Now what this line means is that A can have any type, right? So it could be a number, it could be a text, but it could be also a slice. Now let's just say we just assign the variable a to a string called hello. And by the way, there is a neater form to kind of simplify this interface or any type definition here by just saying any. Any is the same thing as having interface as the type. So type assertions are kind of a way to get the concrete value of an interface type. So let's quickly have a look here what this means. So what we could do is just create a new variable called b and then assign the value a. Now obviously b is in this case any. But what we can do is because we know that a is always a string, we can just cast this a to be a string. And what we can then do is for instance just print the variable b. Right? So what we do here is that we declare the variable a which can be of type any which contains the value hello, which in the end is a string. But then we also declare a variable b, which contains the value of a, but we cast this value to a string. So now b is definitely a string. It is nothing else than a string, all right? That's pretty cool. But the thing is, this expression here, or this assignment can panic, right? So for instance, we can also say that a is a three, and then this line will panic. Now this is pretty problematic because maybe we do not want that this line panics, right? We want to check, okay, is this even a string, right? Or is this kind of castable to a string? Now what we can do instead is just use a simple if statement here and then say B and okay. And then we say if it's okay. And then we just print B again. So what we do with this if statement is it is just a simple one line check if A is really a string right? Or if like this is not panicking, if this expression here is not panicking, then we are printing b in this case. So for that b is only a string in this condition, right? And we cannot access b outside of this condition, which should be real clear, I think. Now I've mixed some things together, right? Obviously casting and type assertions are different concepts, because obviously we can, for instance, cast a to a number directly, right? So what we can say is just int and then a, right? And then maybe assign the variable c here. Now this obviously does not work because a is an interface. However, casting really means that we try to convert a value or a type to another compatible type. And type assertions are there in Golang to really extract a concrete value of an interface type. So for instance, we do not have a specific type for A in this case, and that's why we do need to use type assertions. So we kind of asserted and not casted the A in this expression here. Now type assertions and interfaces in general are really powerful as well when it comes to checking if a method exists in a specific interface variable. A common use case for that would be to just check if a method exists in the interface and then execute it or invoke the function, right? So let me quickly demonstrate here what I mean. 
So we do have this code here and what we have is a foo interface which contains a foo function, right? So this is not good practice here. But then we also have a my struct struct which contains a foo function but also a bar function. Now it is clear that we only have the bar function in our struct, right? It is not part of the interface. But i is an interface, right? So how can we check if like this bar method exists in our i interface before invoking it, right? Because we don't want to directly invoke the function because obviously then it will panic or it will just throw an error. So what we could do is exactly the same thing we've did before, right? We can say if v, so the value and okay, we assign this to i and then we type assert this to an interface which contains the method bar. And then we obviously need to check if the expression panics or not, hopefully not. And then we will just print line or execute the function bar in this case, right? And this now works. So what we got here with this kind of if condition, we basically check if the interface for contains a method or the implementation or the concrete value of the interface for contains a bar function. And whenever it contains this bar function, we just invoke this, right? So hopefully this should be really clear here. And I think this is really powerful when it comes to structs and interfaces. Okay, so let's look at an example which should demonstrate a powerful combination of type switches, but also generics in Golang. Now I think generics are a possible video topic on its own, but general, these combinations are really powerful in Go. Now a type switch in general in Golang means that it contains multiple type assertions and basically the first matching case will return the result or will be executed and the rest will be ignored. So to demonstrate this, let's quickly make a function called process. And in this function, now we use square brackets here to use generics in Go, we say t and then any. Right? So t can be of type interface or of type any in this case. Now then we say value t. So in the end value is now an interface. And now we can apply our type switch. And the type switch basically begins with a switch, right? So the switch keyword. And then we say v and then we assign it to the value any value dot type. Now this might look weird, but let me quickly clarify this expression here. So what we got is we first cast the value, value in this case, which is of type t to any, right? Why do we need to do this? It's because that generics are only determined at runtime. So if we just remove this, we get an error that basically the compiler cannot use type switch on type parameter value value because of variable of type t constrained by any. And that basically means that the type is not 100% correctly determined because it is an interface type, right? Or an any type. Now this dot and then type means that we want to get the type of this casted any value here. Now this is a really special use case for type switches. And it basically only means that we want to retrieve the dynamic type of this value here. So what we can then do is kind of use a case statement and then define the type. So let's say in case of an integer, right? So if v is an integer, we just want to print line integer and then v. Now we can do the same thing with a lot of types, right? Let's say it's case string and we print a string here, but we can also have a default statement which will just print unknown type. Right, and you can obviously imagine that we do a lot more things with v in this case. So for instance, if we have case int, obviously v is an int now. Same for the string case, right? So v is a string. And here the type is unknown. So we just skip the processing part. So let's just invoke this function. Let's just declare a variable with three as a value. And then we say process a. Now, if we want this code, we do get that it is an integer which contains the value three, right? And this is the correct behavior we actually want. Right, so let's get into a real world use case of applying these type switches and type assertions. And a really good example would be to just read files or open files. So let's maybe declare a struct here called read error. And then we can, or let's just rename this to file error. 
And this is a struct, obviously, and it contains the variables or the fields file name, which is a string, and the operation itself. And the operation itself could be opening or reading. Right? So we can obviously have this more explicitly defined here, but I will just keep it simple. Right? And this is an error, and now we kind of embed the error interface here. Right? So we say func, and then e pointer to error, and then it prints an error. Now this has to be file error. And then we just return sprintf. Right? Then we have a pretty simple error message here. And then we say e.filename and e.op for operation. Right? And I forgot that the return value of this error function should be a string. And now we have a complete error function here. So far, so good. No type assertion or type switches needed. So let's now create a function which is called process file. So pretty similar to the function we had before in the previous example. But in this case, this function should open the file and then read the contents out of this file. Right? So what we have now is a simple function called process file. Now this process file function will have a file name parameter and then it might return an error. So let's just make use of the os open function here. So what we can do is file and error and then we say os.open and then we define the name which will be file name. Now then we check if the error is not equal to nil. We now return our custom error, right? Which is the file error error. Right, so simply we say here operation is open. And then we also define the file name, which is file name. Right, so now what we could also have here is just the arrow itself. So we can retrieve the arrow on its own, not only the operation and the file name, but the real caused error here in the struct. But I will, like I said before, keep it simple. Now after that, we will make use of the defer keyword. And I already made a video about the defer keyword there. So feel free to check this out. And then we just close the file in the end of processing this function. Right? And now we want to read the contents of the file. And right? now we declare a buffer to basically declare and pre-allocate the memory for our contents of the file. And for now, it should be 1024 the length of our byte slice here to basically pass into the buffer, right? And then we obviously want to read the file. So we say file.read and then we pass in the buffer here. So this now basically tries to read the file with the buffer slice. So I'm going to make a new video about how to basically read and write two files in Golang. But for now, we are just reading the file. Right. And then we obviously want to check if the error is not equal to nil. So if error is not equal to nil, right, and then we also need to check if the error is not equal to an end of file exception here. And then if this condition is true, we do have an unknown error or like some sort of file error, right? And we only return a file error. And for now we say operation, which is read, and then the file name is the file name itself. Obviously here's an error because we do have error declared before. So we're just going to skip the declaration here and just assign the error to this return error of our read function. Now, if everything was successful, we will just return nil in the end. There we go. Now we basically have a process file function, which is pretty cool, I think. So what we can do with that now is make use of it. So let's just say error and then we call the process file function and then we define a text file, for instance, text.txt. Now this file does not exist, so we will get an error here. And then we check if the error is not equal to nil and now we will make use of type switches. Now obviously I've made clear that we use the file error here, so let's quickly change this to be a path error, right? Because we want maybe to return different errors for this process file function. And this now has the error itself in it as well. And then file name is the path here. So what we got is a path error and a file error. So to make this really clear, let's just, because this is a read error, let's just transform the file error here to be read error. So we say read error here as well. And in the process file function, we do say read error as well. And now we will return for the process file function, a path error or a read error. So with that in mind, we can now make use of type switches. So we say switch E, right? E for the abbreviation of error. And then we say error. And then to get the dynamic type of the error, we just say dot type. 
And now we can say case, and then we say, for instance, os.path error, right? This is here the case when the error E or the dynamic type of the error is a path error. And then for instance, and then we say path error, right? So we just print the path error here. Now we also do have another case, which is the read error itself. And then we just print this again here. And then we can like also feel free to have a default case statement here, which in the end just prints unknown error. Right, so really similar to the generic function we had before, but in this case, we actually do have multiple errors in this case. So if we run this code, we do get in path error, which is expected because the text.txt file does not exist in this case. So instead of using type switches, we can also make use of if conditions here. So what we can do is achieve the same thing we have with this type switch with a if condition. Right? So instead of using this type switch, we can just use type assertions directly. So for instance, we can say if E and OK, or let's just ignore the asserted value here. And then we say error, and then we say OS path error. Right? And if OK, so if basically this expression does not panic, then we print the same error. Right? And obviously we can do the same thing with the read error as well. So we say OK. And then we say read error. Obviously this has to be a pointer here. And then we just print the read error and in a default state, right? So if the error is unknown, we just print unknown error. So this accomplishes the same thing we've used with our type switch, right? So if you run this here, we will get the same error. And if you can see here using the if conditions and type switches does not have really a functional difference. Right? So it doesn't really matter in the end what you use. But clearly using type switches is a more readable way instead of using this if conditions combination here. Right? So this is the more preferable way instead of using these combined if conditions. But obviously in the end it really depends on the use case itself. So for instance if it is just a one liner, for instance if we only have this if condition here, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense to use a type switch. Right? because we do not want the kind of dynamically evaluated value here. We only want to check if it panics or if it is this specific type here. Now, if that was really new to you, then I highly recommend watching this video here where I kind of go over the language Golang in 15 minutes. So everything you have to learn in Golang in just 15 minutes. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.